Good morning. As of yesterday, the city has 13,568 reported cases, 144 people hospitalized with COVID-19, and 414 deaths. I'm here, I'm here every week to ensure our residents that the most up-to-date and accurate information so they in turn can make smart and informed decisions for themselves and their families. We remain focused on continuing to scale up our response to this emergency to ensure residents of our city have the resources and support they need at this time, while continuing to leverage the wealth of medical and public health expertise here in the city of Baltimore. I want to remind residents of the invaluable resources available at coronavirus.baltimorecity.gov. Their residents can find real-time data for Baltimore City as well as locations for where they can get tested. We need everyone, and I mean everyone, to take this serious to drive down our numbers. Like the U.S. Surgeon General said when he was here, everyone needs to practice the three W's. Wear a mask, watch your distance, and wash your hands. And I keep seeing people complaining about masks and asking for exceptions to be made. Let me be very clear, COVID is not making exceptions. We all need to be asking about how we can better protect our family, friends, and neighbors. We need all of our residents to commit to wearing face coverings, it is the easiest thing we can do to slow the spread. We really need everyone to do their part. Again, that means everyone wearing a mask in public when you're unable to socially distance. Social distancing is setting with other people. Now is still not the time to be planning large parties, cookouts, celebrations, or religious events. We're still in a pandemic, one that's built to spread rapidly in large groups. And please continue to wash your hands in high touch point areas often. I know by now everyone has seen photos online of cities all over the South where people aren't wearing their masks in the same areas where COVID transmission is high. Now is the time to set Baltimore apart in our response. Again, I want to thank the majority of Baltimoreans who have heeded the warnings and have followed the guidance. And as always, we continue to monitor the data daily. Now I will ask Baltimore City Health Commissioner Letitia DeRosa to update you on our COVID response and how we are supporting residents and their families in our city. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor Young, for your continued leadership during these difficult times. Today I will keep my remarks pretty brief. As always, I'd like to remind all Baltimore City residents to continue to follow social distancing, face cloth covering over your nose and your mouth, and frequent hand washing guidance. Our data over the last few days has shown some mild improvements with a slightly decreased average case count per day, around 126 cases per day um, in a seven-day average. This could possibly be an early indicator that our aggressive approach to restrictions um, has had some impact. Only time and sustained decreases will tell. In the interim, I encourage all residents to continue doing what they're doing. Keep your distance and wear your face cloth coverings when you're in public. Today, the Baltimore City Health Department will be releasing a small update to our dashboard indicating a lowered goal positivity rate. Previously, we had achieving a less than 10% positivity rate for transitioning into phase three per CDC guidance that was issued in May. Since then, the CDC has advised an even lower threshold of 5% positivity rate, and we wanted our dashboard to reflect these updated recommendations. Our current case counts and other important data points about the coronavirus in Baltimore are found on our website, coronavirus.baltimorecity.gov. I'd also like to spend just a moment talking about how we calculate our positivity rate. Our daily po percent positive is calculated by dividing the total number of positive COVID test results by the number of total COVID test results for a given day. The total is defined as the sum of positive tests, negative tests, and inconclusive tests. The day is based on the specimen collection date or the date the specimen was collected for the actual COVID test. The daily percent positive is affected by test turnaround time, which is the time between when specimens were collected and when test report results were reported by the lab. For example, specimens collected yesterday are less likely to have been processed and reported compared to tests that were collected five days ago. As such, to account for this lag in our resulting time, the city dashboard allows seven days for test results to be reported before it calculates and displays a seven-day average for daily percent positive. 
Our change to the positivity rate threshold from 10 percent to 5 percent is based on national best practices. Our dashboard and the improvements we make to it over time allow Baltimore City residents to view much of the same data that we do in public health. Whenever changes happen, whether a new spike occurs, a change in a threshold indicator, or when our daily case counts drop, the Baltimore City Health Department is committed to ensuring a public, the public is made aware of what's happening. We continue to ask residents for their patience in adjusting to our new normal and to continue abiding by the rules and health order put in place to protect everyone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. DeRosa. On Monday, I joined our fellow delegation to speak out against the action being taken by the President and his administration to hinder the Postal Service in an effort to disrupt mail in ballots for the November election. Let me begin, like I did on Monday, by giving my thanks to the hardworking men and women of the Postal Service. Like so many of our essential workers, the people of Baltimore are grateful for the critical service you provide them each and every day. The Postal Service was not created to generate profits or revenue. It was created to be a service for the American people. And that's what our postal workers want to continue to do, be a service for the community. We are still in the midst of a pandemic and try to force residents to stand in lines and go into the polls is simply not safe, especially when there is an easier and safer option available. Lives are literally on the line in Baltimore as we are home to a medically at risk population. The Postmaster General needs to be transparent with the public about management decisions being made that are resulting in these delays in delivery and explain how his decisions are keeping his employee and the public safe. Now, I know yesterday the Postmaster General said he would suspend changes to the Postal Service to avoid any impact on the 2020 election. But just in case to help Baltimore City residents request an online ballot, I have simplified the process a little bit by adding a button on the city's main webpage that links directly to the Board of Elections to complete the application. Next, I want to talk about the explosion that rocked Northwest Baltimore last week. First, let me again offer my prayers for the two deceased and their families, as well as the other victims of this incident and those whose lives and homes were impacted. I want to publicly salute the residents of our city who rushed into danger to help their fellow Baltimoreans immediately following the ex explosion. Thank you to the first responder and city employees who spent days there digging through debris and rubble to secure the area for the residents. And a very special thanks to our first responders from Baltimore County and Howard County who answered the call when we needed it the most. I want to thank our elected officials like City Council President Brandon Scott, Councilman Yitzi Slifer, Delegate Tony Bridges, and Delegate Dahlia Attar, who showed up early but stayed around late to ensure all of their residents were taken care of. A huge thank you to the American Red Cross, who was probably the first organization on the scene. And they came with food and water for those affected and even provided shelter for some of our displaced residents. Another big thank you to the Maryland Transportation Authority, who provided cooling buses on Monday for residents forced to leave their homes, but also provided transportation for displaced residents. Also, the Maryland Insurance Commission, who have been incredible partners throughout this difficult process. I want to also give a shout out to our religious institution and fraternity organization. Empowerment Temple had held a vigil on Monday night for the two deceased individuals and our black Greek letter organizations all showed up to lend their support. More importantly, as mayor, I humbly appreciate all of the volunteers who showed up to support the cleanup efforts for those residents and that community. When I learned we even had volunteers outside of Maryland, I was touched by the love and support for Baltimore City, for this community and for those who truly needed to see that people care about their well-being. Now I will turn it over to Chief, Chief uh, Charles Savellia, the emergency manager for Baltimore City. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, so at approximately 942, 0942 hours on Wednesday, August 10th, the fire department started receiving calls reporting an explosion in northwest Baltimore without any specific address. 
We dispatched a unit to investigate the reports. At 944, the logistics chief we have for the fire department who was in the area reported in the actual address of the 4200 block of Labyrinth. The initial box alarm was struck out at 945 and units arrived finding three homes completely collapsed, small fires, a strong odor of natural gas, and reports of people trapped in the debris. Crews began initial rescue operations as well as control of resulting active fires, small fires. Additional units as well as our special operational rescue units were requested. In all, we had approximately 20 city suppression units, 15 EMS units, um, plus, the plus our specialty units. We also had about 23 Baltimore County and one Howard County unit that responded as well. Seven occupants were removed from the debris. Unfortunately, we had two fatalities, 20-year-old Joseph Graham and 61-year-old Lonnie Harriet. As of today, the seven rescued victims, five have been discharged, one remains in critical but stable condition, and one is in stable condition. Fire department units remained on the scene throughout the evening and into the next day assisting with the investigation as well as helping those displaced safely be able to evaluate the conditions of their home. The cause remains under investigation. The Mayor's Office of Emergency Management has been on the scene since August 10th, coordinating efforts with other city agencies, BGE, and Red Cross to provide services and resources needed by both first responders and the residents in the area of the explosion. This was an unfortunate and tragic incident to the neighborhood and the community. We will continue to pray for those affected. As, the Mayor, as Mayor Young mentioned, we are truly grateful for the outpour of support from everyone who responded to the incident. I would also like to thank all the first responders with Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County. They did a phenomenal job on this incident. We all, we all had the same goal, and that was to rescue everyone that we could. On behalf of OEM, I would also like to thank all the agencies and volunteers for the support. We understand the recovery was a large undertaking, and having that assistance was instrumental in reducing the impact to the community. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you to everyone for your hard work and tireless efforts on behalf of the people of Baltimore. Finally, starting tomorrow, August the 20th, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone in Maryland, both residents and visitors, will have the ability to text 911 in the event of an emergency. So if you have an emergency and you have a cell phone with text capabilities, you can text 911 and the 911 specialist will respond. This, is, this enhancement is supported by AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon cell phone providers. Text to 911 is an enhancement to the emergency system in our community and will be a great benefit to those who are hearing impaired, speech impaired, and if your call may be put you at a greater risk. While a phone call is still the preferred way to contact 911, this enhancement offers residents and visitors better access to emergency services, and in some cases, safer access. So remember, when you have to dial 911, call if you can, text if you can. And now we'll take a few questions. James. Good morning. Good morning. Um, does the contact tracing data that the city is collecting show that the limitations on restaurants is partially to cause for the decrease in cases, or what, what are you seeing there? So we've only very recently seen the decline, um, and the contact tracing data certainly suggests that there's decreased movement in general. Um, restaurants is certainly one of those locations, but again, I think we impose additional restrictions on, on large gatherings, knowing that um, that could also be a, a nidus as well. Does the contact tracing data break down whether it's large gatherings or restaurants where people 
are potentially picking up the virus, and can you share what those numbers are? So those numbers are, are state-based numbers, so we would have to work with the state to be able to release the numbers at the local level. Um, I know that they've, I think they've released them at the state level, um, but we are in conversations with the state to be able to release that data a lot more widely. Is there a reason for the delay? Uh, it seems like the local level would be more helpful than just at the state. Yeah, so I, uh, we did send a letter requesting additional information, but we'll ask the state to, to see when we can release that. Question for the mayor. Uh, regarding trash, I'm curious to know, I know contractors are coming the next month or two on board, but what else can the city do in the meantime to mitigate the problem? I know a lot of residents are waiting. You've offered, I know, additional places where they can drop off, pick up. So what else is the city doing in, in the interim? Well, I mean, we're doing the best we can with what we have. Um, as you know, some of our workers have tested positive, and we're doing the best that we can. Um, Chalmers, do you want to speak to that? You know, I mean, because, because I call on myself for my own trash, my own recycle, but I understand that people are testing positive, and people are afraid to come to work. Simple as that. Good morning. So, so we are, the current strategy in place, uh, as the mayor just stated, uh, we have several cases of COVID, and to put things in perspective, for the curbside collection program, we require 230 employees daily. Today, we have 163 employees reporting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have uh, 19 employees that are home uh, isolated due to COVID. We have 12 employees uh, quarantined, confirmed cases. Uh, we have uh, 12, um, again, in routine services alone, we have 12 home quarantine employees, 11 from routine services. Of the 19 home isolated, 10 are from uh, routine services. The Bureau of Solid Waste has a total of 75 employees out on sick leave today and 13 on permission leave. And that's a combination of um, extended sick, um, safe, sick and safe, FMLA, uh, A-time and restricted duty. So that hampers operations tremendously each day. So when we start each morning, we have to look at the resources we have and then we have to figure out how to best utilize those resources to manage operations. The strategy that we're putting in place now, we're, trash is a priority. So we cover the trash routes first and then what's left, we do the makeup uh, recycling routes. Saturdays and Mondays are the makeup days uh, for any recycling that we miss. There is some light at the end of the tunnel but not a, <clears throat> excuse me, but not a, a, a fix. We have a, several contractors that we're in, in talks with. We have two that are coming on board, uh, September and October, which will bring some relief. But the overall strategy is to look at um, getting some more contractors on because, you know, again, COVID's not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, the private sector is not immune to COVID cases. So the September and October date is based on the fact that they have to staff up one of the contractors we're working with, that they have a, an, an equipment issue. So they're looking at the city for equipment that we've uh, decommissioned to purchase and put back online so they can assist us. So these are some of the things that we're working on. And would also ask citizens that are in a position to utilize uh, one of our drop-off centers to do so. But the game plan here is to focus on trash, recycling the secondary, and to push that information out. We're pushing that information out daily on the DPW, uh, DPW's website twice a day. So if anybody has any questions or concerns about their recycling, uh, the trash pickup, please look at that website and, and, and get the information from there. And if that doesn't work, create your 311 service request. We are looking at the service request. It is, it, it is a daunting task to deal with so many service requests coming in, but that's the strategy. Thank you. One more question for the mayor. I'm curious. I know right now businesses and restaurants can open with, of course, limited capacity. When do you think we can get back to having public meetings like BOE? A lot are still virtual right now. And well, like I um, said earlier, um, you know, we're facing COVID, you know, and we don't want to put anybody in jeopardy, even myself, you know. So the virtual meetings are working. Um, the news media are welcome to, uh, you know, join those, uh, those uh, meetings. So um, until we get a real handle on COVID, we're not going to meet in public. So simple as that. And, and to get back to the trash issue, I hate trash. Uh, we had closed all of those service requests 
clean alleys and all of that. Alleys are more filthy now than they were. You know, so there's no reason for people to illegally dump when they can take it to our transfer stations. You know, I mean, I'm frustrated too, because um, you know, my trash don't always get picked up on time either. You know, it's the next day or sometime um, two days later. And I know Mr. Chalmers get tired of me calling because my neighbors are knocking on my door saying, what is our trash going to be picked up? I'm frustrated about trash as well, but I understand why we are where we are. Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Young, are you concerned at all about the document shredding that's going on in the Comptroller's office? I have no comment because I don't know anything about it. Does it concern you to hear that? I have no comment about that. <clears throat> this is for emergency management in regards to Labyrinth Road. Um, just have you been able to reach out or talk to the property owner of those three row homes at all? Um, and has there been any contact? Well, at this time, because it's an ongoing investigation, um, we have nothing to say on that. It, everything's still under the investigation, still open and active. And, and for DPW, uh, can you respond to Councilman uh, Z. Cohen's letter that he wrote to the acting director yesterday? Uh, I'm sorry, on Friday? Uh, I, I don't want to respond on behalf of, of the director, but we, we received that letter. We will send a formal response to the uh, councilman's letter. I know that you said that you are updating DPW's website two times a day, but is there anything else that you can do department-wise that would better alert the public, whether it be a text message system, um, talking with community leaders, uh, community associations? I do know that uh, we have our Office of Communications and uh, Community Affairs are sending out uh, notifications to uh, uh, community presidents uh, daily, uh, updating that information. But I have Ms. Yolanda Winkler here, who's the Chief of uh, Communications, and she can speak to that. Good afternoon. So I am the uh, Director of Communications and Strategic Alliances for the Department of Public Works, and I've personally taken responsibility for responding to constituents, responding to the media, and responding to anyone who wants to know the status and how they can get updates on their trash collections and their recycling. Um, we are looking into using Be More Alert, which we have, EOM has, um, text message alert, we're looking into how we can make that possible so people can get updates on a real-time basis. However, again, um, we encourage those who have access to a computer, those who are at home, um, those who have access to social media. Um, we're posting twice a day, as the, as the Bureau had just said, and we're definitely updating our website, the page on our website. It's at um, PublicWorks.BaltimoreCity. I mean, PublicWorks at BaltimoreCity.gov, and so you can go on that uh, website under the COVID-19 page, and you'll see the updates just as we're posting them. We also have five liaisons in our community engagement unit, and uh, we have three PIOs. They are all corresponding daily, almost hourly, if not every half an hour, about what's happening with trash collections and recycling. Thank you. Uh, one more question on the trash. So you mentioned that there are private contractors that are being brought on in September and October. Am I correct? That is correct. Why is that taken so long to arrange for what's obviously a contingency plan to fill the gap? There's plenty of commercial contractors that are operating in the city of Baltimore. Why is it taking well, so long? Well, the, we slip March the 23rd when this pandemic hit, that was one of the first uh, things we started looking at. How can we supplement services? So we started talking to waste haulers. And, you know, waste haulers have a capacity. We're asking them to come in and take on um, a tremendous amount of work. They have to staff up. They have to have equipment. And without the equipment and the staff, they can't assist us. One of the biggest issues is the, the size of vehicles that they currently use. They use 25 cubic yard trucks. Here in the city, we use 16 cubic yard tr trucks and 20 cubic yard trucks. Baltimore City is unique in the, the way that the alleys are structured. There are 10 foot alleys 
with a nine and a half foot truck that we have to maneuver those alleys to collect trash. So those were the obstacles that we had to, um, we had to navigate. Um, so like I said early on, uh, one of the um, haulers is looking at purchasing some of the um, vehicles that we decommission so, that, so they can better assist us. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that may occur uh, with the assistance of a contractor, we may have to tell residents to move their, their recyclables to the front for pickup. I'm not saying that that's, that has, we have made that decision, but just to put everybody on notice, that's a possibility. Um, and and uh, while I'm here, I'd just like to add, uh, Monday night, uh, solid waste workers were in the Hollandtown area picking up trash, recycling. They started at 6 o'clock in the morning. They got done at 12.45 a.m. that night. That's how overwhelmed we are. Then they're expected to be back to work the next morning, 5.30, 6 o'clock. So we're working as hard as we can with the resources that we have to make the city a cleaner place. Again, we, it's, it's all of us. It takes all of us to manage this crisis. We can't manage it alone.